The Neolithic inhabitants of Ireland were pioneers of agriculture, mastering the cultivation of crops and the domestication of animals. Fields of barley and wheat stretched beneath the sky, and herds of sheep and cattle roamed the pastures. These innovations provided a stable food source, supporting larger communities and giving rise to permanent settlements, the foundations of future civilizations. The Neolithic people of Ireland left an indelible mark on history through their monumental architecture. Among these structures, Newgrange stands as a tribute to their ingenuity and understanding of the cosmos. Constructed around 3200 BC, this megalithic passage tomb predates both Stonehenge and the Egyptian pyramids. Each year, during the winter solstice, the rising sun illuminates the inner chamber, revealing a profound connection between the people of this era and the celestial bodies above. As the 5th century dawned over Ireland, the winds of change brought with them a new spiritual era, largely attributed to the missionary zeal of St. Patrick, a figure who would become synonymous with the Christianization of Ireland. Captured as a youth by Irish raiders, Patrick spent years in captivity before escaping and eventually returning to Ireland, this time bearing the message of Christianity. St. Patrick's approach to spreading Christianity was marked by understanding and integration rather than confrontation. He engaged the Celtic traditions, weaving the Christian faith into the fabric of Irish society with wisdom and respect. Legends tell of how Patrick used the shamrock, a plant deeply rooted in the Irish psyche, to explain the concept of the Trinity, thereby linking the new faith with familiar symbols. Under Patrick's influence and his contemporaries, Christianity thrived across Ireland. Monasteries, pivotal to this transformation, served as centers for worship, education and manuscript preservation, establishing Ireland's reputation as a land of saints and scholars. These monastic settlements attracted scholars, pilgrims and students, fostering a vibrant exchange of culture and intellect that reached beyond their geographical boundaries. This openness helped spread knowledge and ideas, securing Ireland's significant role in medieval Europe's cultural and scholarly life. These monasteries served as beacons of learning during the Dark Ages, preserving not only Christian teachings, but also the knowledge of the ancient world. The dedication of Irish monks to copying and illuminating manuscripts ensured that wisdom was not lost to time, contributing significantly to the intellectual revival of Europe. In the aftermath of the Christianization of Ireland, the monastic culture that blossomed across the island became a cornerstone of Irish identity, scholarship and artistic expression. The monasteries of Ireland, with their strict discipline and fervent dedication to the Christian faith, emerged as vital centers of learning, arts and manuscript preservation during the Dark Ages, a period when much of Europe grappled with turmoil and loss of knowledge. Irish monasticism is particularly celebrated for its remarkable contributions to the creation of illuminated manuscripts, masterpieces like the Book of Kells. Crafted with extraordinary skill, these manuscripts are artworks that encapsulate the zenith of medieval Irish artistry. The detailed illustrations and elaborate initial letters on these pages vividly demonstrate the monks' deep spiritual devotion and steadfast commitment to preserving and enhancing the written word. As the 9th century dawned, Ireland faced a new chapter in its history with the arrival of the Vikings. These Norsemen, setting sail from their homelands in Scandinavia, initially came as raiders, drawn by the wealth of Irish monasteries and settlements. The first recorded Viking raids at the end of the 8th century marked the beginning of several centuries of sporadic looting, trading and settlement that would profoundly impact the Irish landscape. Despite the destruction wrought by their raids, the Vikings also emerged as builders and traders, establishing significant coastal settlements that would evolve into some of Ireland's major cities. Dublin, Waterford and Limerick, founded by Norse settlers, became bustling hubs of commerce and culture, where Irish and Viking people, as well as merchants from across Europe, mingled and traded. The presence of the Vikings introduced new dynamics into Irish society, politics and economy, the Norse influence catalyzed increased trade with the wider Viking world and beyond, integrating Ireland more fully into the network of medieval European commerce. Technological advancements in warfare and shipbuilding brought by the Norsemen changed the nature of conflict and facilitated exploration and trade, enhancing Ireland's maritime capabilities. Over time, 
the barriers between Viking settlers and the Gaelic Irish began to dissolve, leading to a significant degree of cultural integration. Mixed marriages became common, weaving together the familial and social fabric of Norse and Gaelic communities. Through these unions, the Viking settlers gradually embraced Christianity, integrating into the spiritual life of Ireland, while also contributing to its diversity. The synthesis of Gaelic and Norse cultures was not confined to family or religion alone, it extended into military tactics and weaponry. The Gaelic warriors adopted Viking arms and armor, enhancing their prowess in battle, while the Norsemen borrowed from Gaelic warfare strategies. This exchange signified a mutual respect and acknowledgement of each other's strengths, embodying a true fusion of martial cultures. The blending of Gaelic and Norse elements birthed a rich cultural mix, evident in the language, art and commerce of the time. Norse words found their way into the Gaelic language while artistic expressions and craftsmanship began to reflect a fusion of Celtic intricacy and Norse robustness. The marketplace, once a place of trade between distinct groups, became a symbol of their integration, where goods, ideas and traditions intermingled freely. As the 12th century unfolds, Diarmate Mac Murchada, the King of Leinster, one of Ireland's four provinces encompassing the ancient kingdoms of Meath, Leinster and Osraig, faces mounting challenges. Located in the southeast and east of Ireland and comprising counties like Carlow, Dublin, Kildare, Kilkenny and others, Leinster was a significant centre of Gaelic Ireland. Mac Machada's reign over this crucial region was marked by aggressive policies and the controversial abduction of Derva Gilla, who was the wife of Tiernan O'Rourke, the King of Braefna, and the daughter of Merchad Ua Maileachlain, the King of Meath. This act sparked fierce resentment among his peers and led to his downfall. Amidst the complex web of rivalry and tension that characterized Irish politics, Leinster under Mac Machada became a battleground for power struggles, setting a tumultuous backdrop for his quest to reclaim his kingdom. The abduction of Dervagilla was the spark that ignited a coalition of chieftains against Mac Machada. Under the banner of Tiernan O'Rourke and with the support of Rory O'Connor, this alliance sought retribution and the complete ousting of Mac Machada from power. The stage was set for a confrontation that would reshape the destiny of Leinster and its king. The coalition's might against him proved overwhelming, and Diarmait Mac Machada faced the stark reality of defeat. Stripped of his title and lands, and with few allies left, he fled into exile. Mac Machada's determination to return set him on a path that would lead him far from Ireland's shores in search of powerful new allies. In his quest to reclaim his throne, Diarmait Mac Murchada's journey led him to the court of Henry II of England and further into the realms of the Norman lords. His plea for assistance found a willing ear in Richard de Clare, known as Strongbow, a formidable warrior seeking his own fortunes. The pact between them, sealed with the promise of marriage to Mac Murchada's daughter and lands in Leinster, marked the beginning of an alliance that would have lasting consequences for Ireland. With the promise of Norman aid secured, Diarmate Mac Murchada prepared for his return to Ireland, not as a defeated exile, but as the leader of a formidable force. The stage was set for a campaign that would alter the course of Irish history, intertwining the fate of the island with the ambitions of foreign powers. Mac Machada's determination to regain his throne would usher in an era of upheaval, setting the foundation for centuries of Norman and English influence in Ireland. 1169 becomes the year Ireland's fate is irrevocably changed. Norman ships land on its shores, and Strongbow's forces commence their military campaign. Their advanced tactics and formidable prowess quickly become evident as they begin to make significant inroads into Irish territories. Under Strongbow's leadership, the Normans swiftly assert their dominance, constructing castles as bastions of their growing power and engaging in both conflict and cooperation with the native Irish lords. The landscape of Ireland begins a transformation under the shadow of Norman ascendancy. In the year 1171, Henry II of England faced a pivotal decision. The Norman presence in Ireland, initially bolstered by his tacit support, had grown into a formidable power under Strongbow. Fearing the establishment of a rival Norman state that could challenge his sovereignty, Henry saw an opportunity to assert his authority and to extend his realm. With resolve, Henry II embarked on a significant expedition to Ireland in 1171, assembling a large fleet 
and an impressive contingent of soldiers and knights. This grand undertaking was a declaration of intent, signaling Henry's determination to bring Ireland under his dominion and secure his legacy. The convocation at the Rock of Cashel was a pivotal moment, where Henry II laid claim to Ireland, demanding homage from its lords. This act was a strategic move to integrate Ireland into his realm, ensuring that the burgeoning Norman influence would not eclipse his own. It was here that Henry's ambitions crystallized, setting the stage for centuries of English influence in Ireland. Henry II's venture into Ireland in 1171 marked the beginning of a complex relationship between Ireland and England, opening a new chapter in the island's history. By securing the allegiance of Irish lords and establishing a system of governance underpinned by English law, Henry laid the foundation for the integration of Ireland into the English crown's domain. This strategic move was aimed at creating a new order that would significantly impact Ireland's political, social and cultural landscape for centuries to come. In the years following Henry II's assertion of lordship, Norman influence rapidly spread through Ireland. The construction of castles and the establishment of towns underpinned by the feudal system reshaped the landscape and the social structure of the island. While this period saw the blending of Norman and Irish cultures, it also introduced new divisions, setting the stage for future conflicts and the complex relationship between Ireland and England. The feudal system brought by the Normans transformed the Irish approach to land and governance. Land was now held in exchange for military service, a concept alien to the Gaelic system of kinship and communal land rights. This restructuring of society underpinned the growing power of the Norman settlers, embedding their influence deeply within the very soil of Ireland. Over time, many Normans became more Irish than the Irish themselves, adopting local customs, intermarrying with Gaelic families, and even taking up the Irish language and laws. This blending of cultures contributed to the rich diversity of Irish identity. As the medieval period unfolded in Ireland, the dynamics of power and identity became increasingly complex. The initial Norman conquest gradually gave way to a nuanced scenario where the area of direct English control receded to a fortified region around Dublin, known as the Pale. Beyond its walls, the once dominant Norman lords found themselves woven into the fabric of Gaelic society, adopting its customs, language, and even its legal system. This process of Gaelicization blurred the lines of identity, creating a unique cultural landscape that defied the rigid distinctions of conqueror and conquered. The English crown, observing the diminishing influence of English norms and laws outside the pale, enacted the Statutes of Kilkenny in 1366 to curb the cultural integration. These laws sought to preserve the purity of the Anglo-Norman identity by prohibiting the adoption of Irish customs, language and attire, and by restricting marriage between the Anglo-Norman aristocracy and the Gaelic Irish. The statutes aimed to reinforce the barriers between the two groups in an effort to maintain English lordship and prevent the complete absorption of the Norman settlers into Irish society. The statutes of Kilkenny, however, could not fully halt the process of assimilation the cultural and social ties that had developed between the Anglo-Normans and the Gaelic-Irish proved resilient, reflecting a shared experience of life on the island that transcended legal decrees. The attempt to legislate identity highlighted the challenges of governing a diverse and dynamic society, where the realities of daily life often defied the simplistic categorizations of law and policy. As the 14th and 15th centuries unfolded, Ireland experienced a significant transformation known as the Gaelic Resurgence, a period when the influence of the Normans began to wane after centuries of dominance. This era was marked by a reassertion of Gaelic identity, as Irish chieftains across the island embarked on a determined campaign to reclaim the territories that had been lost to Norman settlers. The resurgence was deeply cultural, aiming to revive the Gaelic way of life that had been suppressed under Norman rule. This period witnessed a renaissance of Gaelic culture, language and traditions. The Gaelic language, once in decline, now resounded with new vigour in the halls of power, in the marketplaces and in the homes of the common people. The arts, music, poetry and storytelling experienced a golden age, celebrating the Gaelic heritage and its myths and legends, which were meticulously recorded by scribes and scholars 
dedicated to preserving their ancestral legacy. Following Henry II's establishment of lordship over Ireland, successive English monarchs sought to expand and solidify their control. The landscape of Ireland became marked by the ebb and flow of power struggles, with English authorities implementing laws and constructing fortifications, even as many Irish lords continued to resist these impositions, maintaining their own rule and customs wherever possible. Under Henry VIII, England witnessed the seismic shift of the Protestant Reformation, a movement that not only redefined its religious landscape, but also sought to extend its influence to Ireland. Henry VIII, a monarch brought up as a devout Catholic and initially praised for his faith, faced a personal and dynastic crisis as his marriage to Catherine of Aragon failed to produce a male heir. After nearly two decades and only a daughter, Mary, to show for it, Henry's eyes turned to Anne Boleyn, a charismatic lady-in-waiting. Convinced that Anne could provide the male successor he desperately sought, Henry's request for an annulment from Catherine set him on a collision course with the Pope in 1527, marking the beginning of a religious upheaval that would change England forever. In response to the Pope's refusal to grant an annulment, Henry VIII took decisive action that would alter the course of English religious history. He implemented the Act of Supremacy, passed in 1534, declaring himself the supreme head of the Church of England, effectively establishing a separate church that was distinct from the Roman Catholic Church. This act marked the official start of the English Reformation and England's break from papal authority and reshaping England's religious allegiance. His actions led to significant religious and institutional changes in England, including the dissolution of monasteries, which redistributed wealth and land away from the Catholic Church to the crown and loyal nobles. This move also had profound implications for Ireland, where efforts to impose Protestantism and suppress Catholicism introduced new layers of conflict, contributing to the long-standing religious and political divisions between Ireland and England. The repercussions of Henry VIII break from the Roman Catholic Church were profound and far-reaching. The dissolution of monasteries reshaped the landscape of Tudor England, diminishing the Catholic Church's power and influence. The 16th century marked the beginning of Tudor conquest of Ireland, an era marked by intensified efforts to bring Ireland under more direct English governance. The Tudor strategy for Ireland was multifaceted, employing military campaigns to subdue the Gaelic lords, followed by the establishment of plantations. These schemes saw the settlement of English and Scottish colonists on lands confiscated from the Gaelic Irish, fundamentally altering the demographic and cultural landscape. The plantations aimed to secure English control, but instead fostered deep-seated resentment and resistance among the native Irish population, setting the stage for future conflicts. Amidst the Tudor efforts to fortify English authority over Ireland, Henry VIII introduced a pivotal strategy known as Surrender and Regrant. This policy aimed to entwine Irish chieftains within the fabric of English governance by encouraging them to surrender their lands to the English crown, which would then regrant these lands under English law. The move was a bid to extend royal power beyond the Pale, the area around Dublin and Drogheda under direct English control, and reach into the broader realms of Ireland, where Gaelic traditions and social structures remained robust. This integration effort, symbolizing both subjugation and assimilation, set the stage for future conflicts and transformations, particularly in regions like Ulster, where loyalty to the English monarch was neither expected nor secured. Religious differences in particular exacerbated the friction between the two communities. The plantations were part of a broader strategy to create a Protestant stronghold in Ireland, a bulwark against Catholicism that was seen as both a spiritual and political threat by the English crown. This religious dimension added a layer of complexity to the already fraught relations between settlers and natives, embedding sectarianism into the fabric of Ulster society. The impact of the plantations on the native Irish population was profound and immediate. Families who had lived on the land for generations found themselves displaced, their way of life overturned. The loss of land resulted in a loss of livelihood and a profound rupture in the connection between the people and their ancestral heritage. This dispossession became a wellspring of resentment and conflict, sowing seeds of division that would grow into deep-rooted animosities with long-lasting implications for Irish history. The Ulster Plantation's completion marked a significant escalation in tensions, as the native Irish, predominantly Catholic, 
faced the arrival of Protestant settlers from England and Scotland. These settlers, motivated by promises of land and driven by their religious convictions, aimed to establish a society that reflected their homeland's values. This initiative led to the fundamental dispossession of Gaelic lords who saw their lands redistributed to newcomers. These new settlements became strongholds of English and Scottish influence, transforming the Irish landscape and deepening sectarian divides. As tensions grew in Ireland towards the end of the 16th century, figures like Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, emerged as symbols of resistance, uniting Gaelic chieftains and old English settlers in a common cause against Elizabethan England's policies. This period of unrest led to the formation of a formidable alliance between Hugh O'Neill, Hugh Rowe O'Donnell, and other Irish leaders. Together, they created a unified front across Ulster and Connacht, marking a pivotal moment in Irish history as they stood collectively for sovereignty and self-determination. The conflict, known as the Nine Years' War, erupted into full-scale warfare from 1593 to 1603. Under the leadership of O'Neill and O'Donnell, this Irish confederation challenged English forces with unprecedented force. Strategic victories at Clontibray in 1595 and the Yellow Ford in 1598 demonstrated their military prowess and galvanized Irish resistance. These victories, emblematic of their fight for autonomy, rallied widespread support among the Irish populace and underscored the depth of their challenge to Tudor rule in Ireland, setting the stage for ongoing conflict and the quest for national identity. The Siege of Kinsale, 1601-1602, stands as a critical juncture in the Nine Years' War. Spanish forces land on Irish soil, bolstering the resolve of the Irish alliance in their fight against English dominion. However, the English victory in this crucial encounter marks the beginning of the end for the Irish campaign. The defeat at Kinsale quashes immediate hopes of liberating Ireland from English control and foreshadows the difficult choices and consequences that lie ahead for the Irish chieftains. The Treaty of Mellifont in 1603 effectively ended the Nine Years' War, marking a big win for English control over Ireland. This deal signalled the end of traditional Gaelic resistance, highlighted by the departure of key Irish leaders in 1607, a moment known as the Flight of the Earls. Leaders like O'Neill and O'Donnell left Ireland, creating a power vacuum. This made it easier for the English and Scottish to move in and set up settlements in Ulster, pushing forward the Anglicisation and colonisation of Ireland. The war and treaty really showed how important Ireland was to the English crown, and it ignited a strong desire among Irish people to fight for their independence and self-rule, which significantly changed Irish society, culture and who owned the land. After Henry VIII, the implementation of Reformation policies in Ireland was continued and expanded under his successors, most notably Elizabeth I. Her reign saw more aggressive attempts to establish Protestantism, coupled with military campaigns against the Irish lords who resisted English control and remained loyal to Catholicism. It was Elizabeth I and later Stuart Monarchs who furthered the Reformation's impact in Ireland, intertwining religious conflict with political and territorial control. The effort to replace the Catholic Church with Protestantism was met with resistance from an Irish populace for whom Catholicism was not merely a matter of faith, but an integral part of their identity and resistance against English rule. This clash over religion deepened societal divisions, with the underlying conflict rooted in power, sovereignty and identity. The Irish resistance to Protestantism and the English authorities' severe responses set the stage for future uprisings, shaping a divided national consciousness in Ireland. As the Tudor era ended and the Stuart period began under King James I, he launched the ambitious Ulster Plantations. This plan radically changed Northern Ireland by settling it with loyal English and Scottish Protestant settlers. King James I aimed to civilize Ulster by changing its demographic and religious makeup, strengthening English control over a region that had long resisted the crown. This move displaced many native Irish people and drastically altered Ulster's social and economic setup, leading to significant unrest and change. This policy deepened existing divisions and reshaped the social, political and cultural landscape of Ireland. In the year 1641, Ireland stood on the brink of catastrophe. The Irish Rebellion, 
fueled by deep-seated fears of a crackdown on Catholicism and a longing to reclaim lost lands, erupted with a ferocity that would mark a turning point in the nation's history. Initially aimed at capturing Dublin and expelling the English administration, the rebellion quickly spread, engulfing the island in a wave of violence and retribution. The roots of the uprising lay in the accumulated grievances of the Irish Catholic population. Long marginalized and dispossessed by the plantation policies and religious reforms of the English crown, the rebellion was seen as a last, desperate bid to restore Catholic lands and rights. But what began as a focused military campaign soon degenerated into widespread violence, with atrocities committed against the settler population, igniting a cycle of vengeance that would scar the nation. The impact of the rebellion on Irish society was profound and polarizing, deepening the ethnic and religious divides that had long fissured the community. The initial unity of purpose among the rebels fractured under the weight of the conflict, leading to a protracted period of turmoil that would draw in forces from across the British Isles and beyond. As the initial flames of the 1641 rebellion spread, they kindled the broader conflict known as the Confederate Wars, a period that saw Ireland become a battleground in the wider wars of the Three Kingdoms involving England, Scotland and Ireland. In response to the escalating crisis, Irish Catholics united under the banner of the Confederate Catholic Association of Ireland, an unprecedented coalition that sought to navigate the treacherous waters of mid-17th century politics and warfare. This era was characterized by a complex web of alliances and enmities that transcended not only national borders, but also deep-seated ideological divides. At the heart of these conflicts was the struggle for power and governance in England, mirrored in the tumultuous political landscape of Ireland. The Irish Confederates, a coalition formed in 1641 with the primary aim of securing rights and autonomy for Catholics in Ireland, found themselves in a delicate position amidst these broader political schemes. On one side were the English Royalists, firm supporters of King Charles I, who sought to restore him to power following the English Civil War. The Royalists viewed the monarchy as the legitimate ruling power in England and believed in the King's divine right to govern. In their quest to reinstate Charles I, they sought allies who shared their opposition to the parliamentarians. The parliamentarians, on the other hand, represented the cause of the English Commonwealth. They had emerged victorious in the English Civil War, a conflict rooted in disputes over governmental authority, religion and societal order. Championing principles of parliamentary sovereignty and more democratic governance, the parliamentarians viewed the monarchy as a threat to the liberties of the English people and were determined to prevent the restoration of King Charles I to power. Caught between these opposing forces, the Irish Confederates' alliances were shaped by their strategic interests and the shifting dynamics of the conflict. While their primary concern lay in securing a favourable outcome for Catholics in Ireland, the broader conflict between royalists and parliamentarians influenced their political calculations. At times their goals aligned more closely with those of the royalists, who were more amenable to granting concessions to the Catholics in exchange for support. However, this alignment was fraught with challenges, as it placed them at odds with the parliamentarians. The execution of King Charles I in January 1649 marked a watershed moment in British and Irish history. His reign, plagued by disputes over power, religion and governance, led to a brutal civil war between the royalists, who supported the king's absolute rule, and the parliamentarians, who demanded a constitutional monarchy. After years of bloody conflict, the parliamentarians emerged victorious. The king's trial and subsequent execution were a profound statement of the shift towards republican governance under Oliver Cromwell's leadership. This event decisively ended any hopes of a negotiated settlement with the monarchy and signalled the rise of parliamentary supremacy. In Ireland, the execution of Charles I resonated deeply, sending shockwaves through the political landscape. The Irish Confederates, who had allied themselves with the Royalists, hoping for concessions on religious freedoms and self-governance, found themselves in a precarious position. The death of the King meant the loss of a potential ally and the realization that their struggle against the parliamentarian forces would need new strategies. The power dynamics shifted dramatically as the parliamentarians, now unencumbered free from the monarchy, began consolidating control, preparing for a more aggressive stance towards Ireland. 
The death of the king threw the Irish Confederates into crisis mode. They were already fighting for religious and political freedom, but now they feared what a republic under Cromwell, a known critic of royalism and Catholicism, would mean for them. This fear pushed them into a state of heightened alert, worried about their place in this emerging new order. In Scotland, the Covenanters, despite their previous conflicts with Charles I, saw an opportunity to assert their power and safeguard their religious and political gains by crowning Charles II in defiance of the English Parliament. This act was a strategic alignment with royalist forces across the British Isles. The Scots hoped that by crowning Charles II, they could stabilize their position and potentially lead a successful campaign against the English Republic. Charles II attempts to win back his throne hit major roadblocks at the battles of Dunbar and Worcester, where Cromwell's new model army showed its strength. After these defeats, Charles spent a short time on the run in England, avoiding Cromwell's troops with the help of loyal supporters. This tough time showed him as a king who really depended on the courage and loyalty of everyday people. This phase of hiding and escaping not only revealed his vulnerability, but also the strong loyalty of his followers, which later became key to his eventual return to power. Meanwhile, Ireland braced for retribution. With Oliver Cromwell at the helm of the new Commonwealth, his intentions were clear, subdue and pacify through military might and religious reform. Recognizing the strategic necessity to secure England's western flank, Cromwell prepared for an extensive military campaign aimed at crushing any remaining royalist support in Ireland and enforcing parliamentary rule. Known for his military prowess and Puritan zeal, Cromwell's reputation for harshness forewarned of a campaign marked by rigor and severity. This period saw a realignment of forces within Ireland as former enemies united in anticipation of the greater threat posed by Cromwell's impending arrival, promising a dark turn in the conflict that was pivotal for Ireland's future. From 1649 to 1653, Oliver Cromwell's conquest of Ireland unfolded with brutal efficiency. Initiated to subdue the Royalist alliance, and any Irish support for the deposed monarchy, the campaign was characterized by exceptional cruelty. Towns like Drogheda and Wexford witnessed massacres that would be etched in the annals of Irish history as symbols of suffering and resistance. Cromwell's methods, aimed at crushing dissent and securing English control, left an indelible scar on Ireland, reshaping its demographic and political contours for generations. The Cromwellian conquest was a tough time for Ireland, but it really showed the unbreakable spirit of the Irish people. Even though they faced intense suffering and big changes, their strong resilience and ongoing fight for self-rule shaped the future of Ireland. As they rebuilt from the devastation, the Irish kept the memories of their struggles alive, which helped mold a national identity focused on protecting their heritage and working towards a peaceful and independent future. The conquest's impact extended far beyond the immediate loss of life. The widespread confiscation of Catholic-owned land and the transplantation policy, which saw many Catholic landowners and their families forcibly move to the west of the River Shannon, effectively altered the Irish landholding system. This redistribution of land disenfranchised the native Catholic population, but also cemented the dominance of Protestant landowners, reshaping the social and economic landscape of Ireland for generations to come. The death of Oliver Cromwell, the iron-willed Lord Protector, in 1658 threw England into chaos. Cromwell had a lot of power and used it to shape the country according to his Puritan vision. But when he died, he left behind a power vacuum. His strict rule kept things under control, but it also stirred up a lot of political and social tension. With him gone, his successors found it really tough to step into his shoes and manage those challenges. After Oliver Cromwell died, his son Richard Cromwell took over as Lord Protector but he didn't inherit his father's strong authority or political savvy. Richard's rise to power was more about ambition and the need to keep the protectorate going. Unfortunately, he wasn't up to the task. He struggled to handle the demands of running the government, controlling the military, and meeting the needs of an uneasy commonwealth. His lack of authority and inability to win people's loyalty quickly led to general dissatisfaction, making it clear that his leadership wasn't going to last. As Richard Cromwell's control started to slip, the Commonwealth hit a major turning point. The leadership mess made worse the problems that had been simmering since the Civil War. In this uncertain climate, where everyone was craving some stability, 
secret talks kicked off between the sidelined royalists and the more practical-minded parliamentarians. They began to rally around a pretty bold idea, bringing back the monarchy. This idea, once unimaginable, started to look like the best shot at putting things back in order and ensuring smooth governance. More and more people agreed that returning to a traditional monarchy might just be the way to regain the stability they sorely needed. The ineffectual rule of Richard Cromwell culminated in his resignation, marking the end of the protectorate and paving the way for the restoration of the monarchy. As England teetered on the edge of political reform, the stage was set for Charles II's return, a momentous shift that promised to re-establish the monarchy and bring about a new chapter in British history. The restoration of Charles II was a profound shift in the national consciousness, setting the course for the future of the British Isles. In the aftermath of the Cromwellian conquest, the restoration under Charles II brought a glimmer of hope to many Irish Catholics, hoping for the return of their confiscated lands. Charles, schooled in the hardships of exile and the complexities of European politics, was keenly aware of the delicate diplomacy and firm leadership required to heal a divided nation. His ascension to the throne in 1660 marked a turning point as he initiated policies aimed at redressing some of the wrongs committed during the interregnum, albeit with mixed results. While some lands were indeed restored, the efforts were far from comprehensive and the restitution process was riddled with bureaucratic and legal obstacles. Under Charles II, the Act of Settlement 1662 emerged as a cornerstone policy, attempting to address the chaotic land ownership issues in Ireland. This act often favoured Protestant settlers, preserving much of the Cromwellian land redistribution. Despite some efforts to redress the injustices of the previous decade, with a limited return of lands to Catholic landowners dispossessed during Cromwell's campaign, the restitutions were far from comprehensive. Many Catholic landowners found themselves unable to reclaim their ancestral properties, leaving a significant portion of the population disenfranchised and bitter. This policy, while intended to stabilize land tenure, inadvertently perpetuated the sectarian and social divisions within Ireland. For many Irish, the promise of the restoration remained unfulfilled as the Cromwellian settlement stayed largely intact, ensuring the continued dominance of Protestant land ownership and further marginalizing the Catholic majority. This time laid the groundwork for the Williamite Wars at the end of the century, a conflict that deepened the religious divides. The shaky peace of the Restoration era was shaky because it rested on unresolved tensions and conflicting loyalties, showing that society was still struggling with the effects of past conquests and rebellions. The peace that came after the Restoration was pretty shaky. On the surface, things seemed calm in Irish society, but underneath, it was like a boiling pot of unresolved tensions and clashing loyalties. The quick fixes made didn't really heal the deep resentments between the Protestant settlers and the native Catholic population. Problems like land grabs and religious bias left a lasting mark, keeping distrust and instability alive. This set the stage for more trouble down the line. As the century drew to a close, the ascension of William of Orange and the deposition of James II transformed the simmering tensions in Ireland into open conflict. James II, a Catholic, was deposed in favour of his daughter Mary and her husband William, both Protestants, in what was known as the Glorious Revolution. This shift in the English monarchy resonated deeply in Ireland, where James found robust support among Catholics. The alignment of Irish Catholics with James II, coupled with the Protestant majority's support for William and Mary, ignited the Williamite Wars. This conflict, rooted in the deep sectarian divide, tested the allegiances formed during the Restoration and deepened the religious and political divisions, culminating in a significant and enduring impact on Irish history. Following the Williamite Wars, the Treaty of Limerick in 1691 initially promised certain rights to Catholics, but was subsequently undermined by the English Parliament. This breach of faith led directly to the implementation of the penal laws a series of harsh regulations aimed at crippling the Catholic majority's ability to participate in public and economic life. These laws restricted Catholic worship and education and barred Catholics from holding public office, owning land or entering professions. The penal laws deepened the sectarian divide, 
embedding systemic inequalities that further alienated the Catholic population and set the stage for centuries of struggle. Throughout the 18th century, despite severe restrictions, Irish Catholics found ways to preserve their heritage and faith. Hedge schools proliferated as a form of silent rebellion against the ban on Catholic education, and secret masses were held, maintaining religious observance despite the risks. This period of quiet resistance and community solidarity, though fraught with hardship, gradually fostered a sense of unity and purpose among Irish Catholics, laying the groundwork for the more organized civil rights movements that would follow. As the 18th century drew to a close, Ireland was a nation simmering with discontent. The oppressive penal laws and economic hardships imposed by English rule had left deep scars on the population. This discontent was not confined to the Catholic majority, Many Protestants and dissenters also felt the sting of injustice. The stage was set for change, as the ideals of liberty and equality that had ignited revolutions in America and France began to resonate deeply with the Irish people, stirring dreams of independence and reform. The Society of United Irishmen, founded in 1791 by visionaries such as Theobald Wolftone, emerged as a pivotal force for change. Inspired by the Enlightenment ideals and the recent successful revolutions abroad, the society advocated for an Ireland free from sectarian divides and English domination. Their radical message of unity and equality quickly gained traction, drawing in members from various religious and social backgrounds, all united by the shared goal of an independent and inclusive Ireland. The rebellion erupted in May 1798, ignited by years of oppression, and sparked by the immediate threat of mass arrests of United Irishmen leaders. Across Ireland, thousands took up arms, with significant uprisings in counties like Wexford, Antrim and Down. Despite being poorly equipped and facing a well-armed professional army, the rebels displayed remarkable resilience. Battles such as the one at Vinegar Hill became emblematic of their courage and the brutal response by the British forces. Although the 1798 rebellion was ultimately suppressed, its impact resonated far beyond its immediate aftermath. The brutal crackdown that followed could not extinguish the flame of Irish nationalism that the rebellion had kindled. The rebellion of 1798 thus marked a crucial turning point in Ireland's long struggle for independence, setting the stage for the continued fight for freedom and equality in the centuries to come. In the dawn of the 19th century, Ireland stood at a crossroads, marked by the enactment of the Act of Union in 1801. This pivotal legislation officially merged the Kingdom of Ireland with the Kingdom of Great Britain, creating the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Motivated by British desires to consolidate control in the wake of the 1798 rebellion and to quash any aspirations for Irish independence, the Act of Union sought to bring Ireland under direct rule from Westminster, effectively dissolving the Irish Parliament. The Act of Union, in 1801, which merged the Irish and British parliaments, was introduced with promises that swayed certain factions within Ireland, particularly with the Pledge of Catholic Emancipation. This reform was crucial, as it was meant to allow Catholics the right to hold public office, addressing long-standing grievances. Initially, this promise garnered some support among the Irish, who hoped that union with Britain might lead to significant political and social reforms. However, as years passed without the fulfillment of these promises, frustration and disillusionment began to set in among the populace. The Union received mixed reactions in Ireland. Some saw it as a chance for the much-needed Catholic emancipation, which would allow Catholics to hold public office, fulfilling a major demand of the Irish people. However, these reforms were delayed for decades, leading to widespread dissatisfaction and political unrest across the country. As the years passed without the promised Catholic emancipation, the initial optimism about the Act of Union turned into frustration. This broken promise not only undermined the trust of the Irish people, but also energized a growing nationalist movement. Leaders like Daniel O'Connell emerged, harnessing this mounting frustration for organized political action. The failure to deliver Catholic emancipation became a powerful rallying cry that united a wide range of Irish society against the Union. The dissolution of the Irish Parliament dealt a big hit to Irish self-rule, seen by many as wiping out Ireland's legislative voice. The Act of Union didn't bring unity. Instead, it moved all authority to Westminster, silencing Ireland's representation 
and deepening feelings of disenfranchisement among both the Catholic majority and some Protestants. This shift was seen not just as a structural change, but as a loss of Irish political and cultural identity. It fueled divisions, sparking a century-long fight for self-rule and religious rights. This era saw a surge in Irish nationalism and calls for Catholic emancipation as activists, politicians and ordinary people came together to challenge the Union's very foundations. Far from dampening the Irish spirit, the challenges of the post-Union period reignited a sense of identity and purpose. This set the groundwork for the relentless pursuit of independence that would characterize Irish history through the 19th and into the 20th century. By the early 19th century, the push for Catholic emancipation really picked up steam, led by key figures like Daniel O'Connell. O'Connell was a master at using new methods of mass politics, legal action, and drawing international support through the Catholic Association. He tapped into the popular will, organizing peaceful rallies, gathering petitions, and collecting Catholic rent to finance their efforts. This movement united Irish Catholics in a common cause for emancipation. O'Connell's work led to the Catholic Emancipation Act of 1829, which finally allowed Catholics to hold public office and was a major win against the repressive penal laws. This victory was a pivotal moment in Irish history, inspiring future generations to keep fighting for equality and self-rule. From 1845 to 1852, Ireland faced an unparalleled crisis. The Great Famine, triggered by a potato blight that ravaged crop after crop, plunged the island into a nightmare of starvation and disease. The reliance on potatoes for sustenance meant that the blight didn't just destroy food, it decimated a way of life. As the crops failed, the stark reality set in. Millions would face starvation in one of the most devastating famines in human history. As the famine deepened, Ireland's landscape was marked by scenes of despair and desolation. Families, evicted from their homes and stripped of their livelihoods, faced the cruel realities of starvation and disease. The death toll mounted, with about one million lives lost to hunger and the illnesses that followed. The workhouses intended as a solution to the crisis became overwhelmed, their conditions dire. The famine laid bare the profound vulnerabilities and inequities in Irish society, exacerbated by inadequate relief measures and the complexities of British rule. The famine propelled a massive migration, with up to 2.5 million people leaving Ireland in search of a better life. This exodus created the Irish diaspora, spreading Irish culture and identity worldwide. In their new homes, the Irish formed tight-knit communities that clung to their homeland's traditions, enriching the cultural landscape of countries around the globe. Born from tragedy, this dispersion played a key role in bringing Irish culture to the world stage and establishing strong connections between Ireland and other countries. The demographic landscape of Ireland changed drastically due to the famine. Villages were left empty and the countryside was shaped by the mass departure of those fleeing starvation. This wave of emigration reshaped Ireland's population, culture and identity, particularly influencing communities in the United States, Canada and Australia. The Irish diaspora became a pivotal force in spreading Irish culture globally and shaping how Irish identity is perceived abroad. The Great Famine deeply wounded Ireland, leaving behind a legacy of loss, resilience and survival. As we remember the millions who suffered and the many who were forced to emigrate, we also honour the unyielding spirit of the Irish people. This tragic time in Ireland's history led to a widespread diaspora, spreading Irish culture across the globe and ensuring that the memories and heritage of those who were lost continue to be celebrated and remembered. Out of this period of intense hardship, a global Irish community emerged, a clear sign of the strong connections that bind the Irish to their homeland and to each other across distances and through the ages. As the 19th century waned, Ireland found itself in the grip of a powerful surge of nationalism, a tide that sought to sweep away centuries of foreign rule and establish a measure of self-government through the Home Rule movement. This period marked a significant shift in the Irish political landscape, as leaders like Charles Stuart Parnell emerged to champion the cause of Irish autonomy, capturing the imagination and support of the nation. The Home Rule movement advocated for a form of self-government for Ireland within the framework of the United Kingdom, 
a proposal that aimed to address the long-standing grievances and aspirations of the Irish people. Through passionate advocacy and relentless campaigning, Parnell and his allies succeeded in bringing the issue of home rule to the forefront of British and Irish politics, achieving notable support both in Ireland and among sympathetic members of the British Parliament. The push for home rule in Ireland faced many challenges. Particularly strong opposition came from Unionists in Ulster, who were worried about the idea of being ruled by a predominantly Catholic and nationalist Ireland. This resistance highlighted the deep divisions within the country and showed how complex it was to balance the desire for national unity and autonomy against the backdrop of religious and political differences. Despite these obstacles, the rise of nationalism and the Home Rule movement in the 19th century marked a key time in Ireland's history. It was a time when Irish identity grew stronger and there was a clear call for political and social reforms. The efforts of leaders like Parnell and the Home Rule movement set the stage for future independence movements, showcasing the enduring Irish spirit of resistance and the relentless drive for self-determination. As the 19th century unfolded, Ireland saw a significant cultural renaissance that aimed to reconnect the nation with its Gaelic heritage. Amidst political turmoil and social change, this Gaelic cultural revival became a key factor in Ireland's journey toward national self-discovery and unity. It was both a nostalgic look back and a vibrant reassertion of Irish identity, celebrating the language, history and culture that had been sidelined under centuries of foreign rule. The revival touched all corners of Irish life. Language schools and societies popped up everywhere, aiming to preserve and promote the Irish language, a key element of Gaelic identity. Traditional music and dance also saw a resurgence, with festivals and competitions breathing new life into old tunes and dances that had been part of Ireland for ages. Irish literature and the arts thrived, drawing on the nation's rich mythology and folklore to express a modern Irish mindset that looked both backward and forward. The movement wasn't just about cultural activities. It also invigorated Irish theatre and visual arts, where artists and playwrights explored themes of national identity, historical struggles and the beauty of the Irish landscape. The Gaelic cultural revival was a potent force for national unity and pride, providing a cultural base that supported Ireland's political goals, uniting people with a renewed sense of identity and purpose. This reawakening was a celebration of Irishness and a clear statement of Ireland's unique place in the world, distinct from British influence and rich in its own traditions and values. In the spring of 1916, Dublin was the backdrop for a pivotal event in Irish history, the Easter Rising. This six-day uprising didn't succeed militarily, but it was a crucial moment in Ireland's fight for independence. It showcased the unyielding spirit of a nation determined to break free from British control. The rebels made up of various nationalist groups, took over key spots across Dublin and declared the establishment of the Irish Republic. The General Post Office in Dublin became the centre of the rebellion, where the Declaration of Independence was publicly read, resonating through the streets and urging the Irish people to join the fight for freedom. The British response to the Easter Rising was swift and severe, plunging the city into conflict. Despite facing a clear military defeat, the determination of the leaders and the courage of the volunteers captured the hearts of the Irish people. Instead of crushing the spirit of rebellion, the execution of the Rising's leaders sparked a major shift in public opinion. What started as a military uprising became a symbol of national awakening. The true importance of the Easter Rising isn't in the immediate results, but in its deep effect on the Irish mindset. It spurred a national drive toward independence, changing the entire landscape of Irish politics and society. The Rising is remembered for its boldness and vision, and for laying the groundwork for the ongoing fight for Irish sovereignty that followed. The year 1918 marked a seismic shift in the Irish struggle for independence, culminating in Sinn Féin's landslide victory in the general election. This triumph was a political victory and a resounding mandate from the Irish people for independence from British rule. Sinn Féin, a party that had boldly advocated for the establishment of an Irish Republic, captured the imagination and hopes of a nation eager to forge its own destiny. In a defiant rejection of British parliamentary rule, the elected Sinn Féin MPs chose not to take their seats in Westminster. Instead, 
they convened in Dublin to form Dáil Éireann, a revolutionary parliament that symbolized the aspiration for Irish sovereignty. The formation of Dáil Éireann and the declaration of Irish independence were acts of profound political and symbolic significance, representing a decisive break from British authority and a bold step towards the realization of a sovereign Irish state. The establishment of Dáil Éireann by Sinn Féin in the aftermath of the 1918 general election was a pivotal moment in the Irish struggle for independence. It underscored the depth of Ireland's desire for self-rule and set the stage for the tumultuous years that would follow as the nation embarked on a path towards securing its freedom. Sinn Féin's victory and the subsequent creation of Dáil Éireann marked significant milestones in Ireland's political history, showcasing the nation's strong commitment to self-determination and its pursuit of a future shaped by its own values and aspirations. The years 1919 to 1921 marked a critical period in Ireland's long history of struggle against British rule, culminating in the Irish War of Independence. This conflict, waged by the Irish Republican Army against the might of the British Empire, was characterized by a guerrilla campaign of ambushes, sabotage and intelligence gathering, reflecting a new phase in the Irish quest for sovereignty. The war was a test of endurance and strategy, with the IRA leveraging the terrain of Ireland and the support of its people to mount a formidable challenge against British forces. The conflict involved significant violence, including clashes between the IRA and British forces, as well as harsh reprisals against civilians by the Crown forces, which aimed to suppress the Irish resistance. The culmination of the War of Independence was the negotiation and signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in December 1921, a moment fraught with controversy and compromise. This agreement established the Irish Free State as a dominion within the British Empire and partitioned Ireland, leaving six counties in the north as part of the United Kingdom. While this treaty marked a significant step towards Irish self-determination, it also sowed the seeds for future conflicts by leaving the question of Irish unity unresolved. The Irish Civil War, which raged from 1922 to 1923, stands as one of the most painful chapters in Ireland's journey towards independence. The signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which had brought the War of Independence to a close, ignited a fierce debate among Irish nationalists, leading to a split that would plunge the country into civil war. On one side were the pro-treaty forces, who accepted the compromise with Britain as a stepping stone towards greater autonomy. On the other, the anti-treaty forces, who saw the treaty's acceptance as a betrayal of the dream for a fully independent Ireland. The Civil War's conclusion saw the defeat of the anti-treaty forces, but the victory was costly. The bitterness and division sown during the conflict would linger in Irish society and politics for generations. The ideal of a united and fully independent Ireland remained elusive, with the partition of the island and the establishment of the Irish Free State leaving a legacy of unresolved issues and grievances. After the tumultuous events of the Civil War, Ireland took significant strides towards defining its identity and sovereignty. In 1949, the Irish Free State transitioned into the Republic of Ireland, finally cutting all constitutional ties with the British Commonwealth. This marked a new chapter of full sovereignty and independence. Throughout the mid-20th century, the Republic focused on laying down its economic foundations, steering clear of the conflicts of World War II, referred to as the emergency, and later strengthening its ties with Europe by joining the European Economic Community. These steps not only boosted Ireland's economy, but also its standing on the world stage. While the Republic was finding its footing, Northern Ireland was engulfed in a devastating conflict known as the Troubles, starting in the late 1960s. This period was defined by intense sectarian violence between mainly Catholic nationalists who desired unification with the Republic of Ireland and predominantly Protestant Unionists who wished to remain part of the UK. The violence, which included bombings, shootings and riots, caused significant loss of life and deepened the historical sectarian divisions, making everyday life fraught with tension and fear. The late 1960s also saw the rise of the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland, inspired by the global push for civil rights. The movement, primarily advocating for the Catholic minorities' rights in a state dominated by Protestant majorities, faced severe suppression. 
This suppression, in turn, fueled wider support for the Irish Republican Army and escalated the conflict further. In 1972, in an attempt to stabilize the situation, the British government imposed direct rule over Northern Ireland, effectively suspending its parliament and taking full control of the administration. The culmination of these turbulent decades came with the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, a groundbreaking peace accord that sought to address the root causes of the conflict. This agreement established a power-sharing government in Northern Ireland, recognizing and respecting the identities and rights of both nationalist and unionist communities. It also laid out plans for disarmament, the release of political prisoners, and established ongoing mechanisms for human rights protections. Most importantly, it marked the beginning of a significant reduction in violence and a hopeful start to a complex but vital peace process. The journey from the establishment of the Republic of Ireland to the peace process in Northern Ireland represents a profound transformation in Irish history. While challenges remain, the strides made toward economic development, sovereignty and peace have reshaped the island's destiny. As both the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland continue to navigate their paths, the legacy of their struggles and the achievements of their peace efforts offer proof of the resilience and potential of reconciliation in the face of deep-seated divisions. This history not only defines the character of Ireland today, but also continues to inspire peace efforts worldwide. As we close this chapter on Ireland's remarkable journey, a tale woven from the threads of history, culture, and the enduring spirit of its people and diaspora, we invite you to join us in celebrating and sharing this rich heritage. Ireland's story is not just one of the past. It's a living narrative that continues to unfold, shaped by the contributions and connections of individuals around the globe. By liking, sharing and subscribing to our channel, you become an integral part of this ongoing story. You help to bridge distances, connect cultures and illuminate the myriad facets of Ireland's identity and impact on the world. Together, we can ensure that the legacy of Ireland's past informs its future, fostering a global community united by a shared heritage and a mutual appreciation for the beauty, resilience and spirit of the Emerald Isle. Let's continue this journey together, exploring the landscapes, legends and legacies of Ireland. Like, share and subscribe to join a community of curious minds and passionate hearts eager to celebrate and spread the wonder of Ireland's story. Thank you for being a part of this journey.